The Holy Gospel according to St. John. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Judeans who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Judeans said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. But I said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when Jesus had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with cloth, strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to Christ. Please be seated. Can we turn this down just a little bit? I have a tendency to get louder as I go on. It could be quite unpleasant. What is a saint? Well, that's certainly no. I, I bet most of you in this room have attended I don't know how many serv worship services over the course of your lifetimes. I won't be estimating those years necessarily, but the course of your lifetimes, and you've heard that phrase poised again and again. What is a saint? I'm going to suggest to you that we go with, uh, with that we just start with what my fa what my dad said was a saint. My dad answered that question by saying that the closest thing to a living saint he could imagine was his mother-in-law. How often does that happen? And it was true, she was, a, I'm, I'm not going to give you a, a, a list of her attributes and her glories and everything, but suffice it to say, we grew up hearing every sentence, at the end of every sentence was, God love you, honey. And she lived like that well. And my father is in a position to know what might be a saint, or at least what he might imagine to be a saint. And I think for some respect, in some respects, we all have an image of what a saint is, and he he had his because, because of his own mother, who was a complicated and tortured woman, the pain of whose broken childhood weighed heavily upon her the whole of her life and colored all of her relationships and ended in suicide. Well, when I was a young girl, both women, each of our grandmothers whom we called Grandmother Light and Grandmother Dark. They came to Fairfield uh, on the bus to visit us. And they, each, uh, they stepped down off the Continental Trailways bus at the Hunt Hotel, one right after another. And as we collected their luggage, we asked them how the bus ride was. And the closest thing to a living saint said, said that the, the ride was extraordinarily lovely, the climate in the bus was temperate and comfortable, that there was the most adorable little boy in the seat ahead playing hide and seek with her. It was just perfect, she said. But my father's mother said, it, 
was the worst bus ride she'd ever endured, and believe her, she had endured some bad bus rides. The bus was hot and stifling and stuffy, and the least attentive parents in the world failed to corral the most obnoxious, runny-nosed urchin who disturbed the conversation between her and the closest thing to a living saint. For the whole three-hour ordeal, which was so much longer than it needed to be, since the bus stopped at every no-count town in between Des Moines and Fairfield. So it's not hard to understand my father's dichotomy based on his experience. It was always hard to believe they had the same experience when they were with each other. Because they were always laid out that way. What is a saint? What is a saint? Is a saint the closest thing to our imagination of what a saint is? Is it one who apparently keeps on the sunny side like the Carter family always sang about? Or could it include those who are the most broke down the most beat down, the most tortured, and one who, by virtue of their pain, inflict themselves on others. Now maybe, since you're all good Lutherans, you probably recognize that's a false dichotomy. <laughs> and it certainly was in the case of my grandmother's, uh, you know, although uh, my mother never let on, but... But her mother, Saint the, uh, Grandma Light, her mother was a, a beautiful woman, but very rigid. Very rigid. I never knew that. She wasn't rigid with me, but then she was my grandma. And in ways that, you know, made kind of an interesting life for my mom. Maybe not as free a one as she could have had. So we all know. Uh, well, and then I, I have to say the other grandmother, the one thing that they could say about her at her funeral, as tortured as she was, the one thing that they could say was that she truly loved her children, and she did indeed truly love all of her children. So it's a false dichotomy. We're not going to get anywhere thinking about either this or that, this good light thing, this bad dark thing. So let's try another attempt at what is a saint. Leonard Cohen, he's a poet, or was a poet. You, who knows who Leonard Cohen is? Raise your hand. Okay. Some of the rest of you probably do know it, but don't know that you do know it. Okay, Hallelujah. Exactly. He wrote the, the song Hallelujah. Um, and some of you of a certain age, you might go back to your hippie freak days, if there were any of you in here. Um, he wrote uh, Suzanne. Suzanne takes you down to the place by the river. You, no, no, maybe not. <laughs> maybe you just were the normal people. <laughs> what is a saint? He's a, Leonard Cohen was a, 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 is a Jewish man, was a Jewish man. He just recently died last year, I believe it was, or a year before. In 1966, in a book, Beautiful Losers, he wrote this. He wrote, what is a saint? A saint is someone who has achieved a remote human possibility. It is impossible to say what that possibility is. I think it has something to do with the energy of love. I like the quote. It's a lot longer. But we can reduce it down this morning. And say a saint is, has achieved a remote human possibility that has something to do with the energy of love. When Jesus arrives at the home of Lazarus, he finds that his friend has died. And, you know, at that moment I think he justifiably hears the accusation of the one sister, Mary. For he has tarried, as we know from reading the rest of the, uh, the text, uh, the beginning portions of chapter 11, 
when he was told that his friend was sick unto death, he said, oh, let's stay a couple more days. And that seems so callous and even makes him seem so callous if what he's trying to do is prove a point. The point is he didn't come right away. And so he justifiably, I think, we would be justified in hearing his one, the one sister, Mary's, veiled, no, let's call it a passive-aggressive accusation. Passive-aggressive. If you had been here, my brother, not your friend, my brother would not have died. Now most of us turn tail and run when we see that. I think she thought he was a saint, by the way. I think she thought he was a good enough friend that he'd show up when his friend, when his friend was sick unto death. I think she thought he was a good enough friend to say, I have the power to help this man. He'll show up before he dies. It doesn't look like love what Jesus did. Doesn't look like love. Doesn't look like it to us. But nevertheless, however difficult the story is, when he gets there, he sees the grief of the sister. He sees the grief of their friends and their family in the community. And he is moved, deeply moved, to go to the tomb. The text has a word, a word that translates from Greek into English, not so much as deeply moved as angered. It is, uh, And he goes there to weep with them, to weep for them, to weep for the loss of his friend, which, which we can only assume and rightfully assume he feels as deeply as they, and more deeply still. And the people around saw him. They saw him, and they said, some of them said, see how he loved them. They, they read those tears. They, they saw that compassion. Some, there is something to do with the energy of love in those tears, in that sorrow, in that compassion. Something to do with the energy of love that translates to the gathered community. But some of the other folks, some of the other folks, they're pragmatists. Some of the other folks see a problem that needs fixing and want to fix it. Some of the other folks who have heard and understood the buzz around Jesus' work in other towns and among other peoples, they know about the healings elsewhere. Some of the other ones, they're, they're results-oriented people. They're the ones who believe there's a fix to every problem. They're the ones that want to know on this day when they see those tears from that guy who arrived too late to do anything about it, want to know what? He could restore sight to the blind, but he can't intervene before death while there was still hope. You know people like that. Yeah. Maybe you've been one. And then something having to do with the energy of love steps to the tomb and demands that it be opened in the face of protests. That it is too late. That it's going to be too messy. It's going to be too ugly. It's going to be too rank. It is going to be too hopeless. Something to do with the energy of love does that. Anyway. Because there is nothing sensible there is nothing wise, there is nothing reasonable, there is nothing pragmatic, there is nothing at all specifically human whatsoever in the energy of love that steps forward in Jesus Christ that day. It is the divine love that steps forward. Something to do with the energy of love that goes beyond human wisdom, beyond human finitude, beyond human reason, beyond human love, beyond human desire, it steps to the tomb and commands Lazarus to come out. Something to do with the energy of love. Restores life to Lazarus. Transfers him from the realm of a dead saint, because he was that for taking care of his sisters, to perhaps something like a living saint again. 
So if we want to answer the question today, uh, at least in some respect, what is a saint? A saint is one who has been touched, who has been washed, who has been healed and has been redeemed with that love. One who has been redeemed from death, one who has been restored to the love of brothers and sisters, one who is redirected, one who loves, not perfectly, but loves. A saint is also one who never really gets close to living sainthood, such as we might describe it. A saint is one who still bears much of the smudge and the soil. As Gerard Manley Hopkins, the poet, said, and, all of the, and, and some of the stench of the grave. And still one in whom something to do with the energy of God's love is pushed out into the world beyond our own excellence. Something to do with the energy of God's love is pushed out into the world unbounded by our sinful and selfish stench. A saint is one who has been resurrected, is crucified with Christ and resurrected again and again and again. Because you know what? Lazarus had two of them. Or at least maybe he awaits the second one. But the first one, we have no reason to believe that he didn't die again, do we? Because we'd probably be following Lazarus if that were the case. A saint is one who's been crucified with Christ and resurrected again and again by something to do with the energy of love. So, the last question or set of questions that that belong to this sermon, that belong to a consideration of what is a saint, is what do saints do? What do they look like? How do they operate? Where do they go? And for that, I want to share with you a, a, a reading from a book by Madeline Lengel. It's, the book is A Stone for a Pillow. But now I'm wondering, how many people know that name, Madeline Lengel? Okay. How many people have read The Wrinkle in Time? Okay. How many people have seen the movie yet? Don't bother. <laughs> She wrote a wonderful, I, I, I read that when I was in the fourth grade, and believe you me, I, it still sticks with me. So it says something about her capacity to, to frame a story that is meaningful and lifelong. And so I hope you hear the same in this excerpt, because she says, there's a story of a good man who dies and goes to heaven and who is welcomed at the pearly gates, which are thrown open for him to enter. And he goes through them in a daze of bliss because it is everything he has been taught. Golden streets, milk and alabaster and honey and golden hearts. He wanders the streets lost in happiness until after a while he realizes that he's all alone. He hasn't seen anybody at all. He walks and walks and sees nobody. So he goes back to the gates and he asks, Peter? Yes, son. This really is heaven? Oh, yes, my son. Do you like it? Oh, it's just wonderful. But where is everybody? Where are the prophets? Where is the holy family? Where are the saints? Peter looks at him and says, oh, them, they're all down in hell ministering to the damned. If you'd like to join them, I'll show you the way. We know that Jesus 
You know, when we used to say the creed, we used to say, descended into hell. And we changed it to the dead. And I just want to share with you, you know, it's not because we changed it because it's non-scriptural, scripture, whatever. But, you know, some things get lost and some things get added in translation, as you might well expect. And the original meaning of going to hell meant going into death. Not to Hades, not to that place, but hell. The word hell is a, is a Nordic word, a Teutonic word, and it has, the, it, it has lots of other words that go with it or that, that are a version of it. Did you know that? The word hell, which we have come to understand is the hot place nobody wants to show up. But hell also has the same root word as hall and hall and hole. So it meant to be buried. It meant to be buried. What is a saint? Where does a saint go? A saint goes where people suffer, where people are broken, where people have a sickness unto death, where Jesus has gone before them. And if you'd like to show them, if you'd like to join them, he will show you the way. What is a saint? You're a saint. Every last cotton-picking one, as they say down south, bless your heart. 